the age of 53, the future looked bleak for Livia Drusilla. Drusus, her youngest son, had met his demise on the battlefields of Germania, while her oldest, Tiberius, had retired to the far-off island of Rhodes, abandoning Rome to the devices of her illustrious husband, Caesar Augustus, the Princeps Civitatus of Rome. Her sons, the lifeline of any noble Roman woman, had apparently not found favor with the gods, leaving her vulnerable and isolated within the home of the son of a god. This man, Augustus Caesar, who ruled over her, she was now caught defenseless between her husband's anger toward Tiberius, his stepson turned son-in-law, who had frustrated his plans, and her daughter-in-law, Julia's mysterious plans, which seemed not to include her son. Her husband's daughter, Julia, had apparently set her sights elsewhere. She'd also demonstrated a fair amount of her father's political savvy by accomplishing the electoral victory of her 14-year-old son, Gaius Caesar, for the 6 BC consulship. Her popularity with the city's plebs and the influence of her maternal Cornelian family had helped to sway the vote in his favor. While Julia's father was publicly outraged at the ridiculous preference of the Roman voters, he must have been secretly delighted. Even before Gaius had reached the legal age of 20, the people of Rome had chosen his grandson and adopted heir as their consular representative, making it quite easy for Augustus to bow to the will of the people. Although reason dictated he postpone its fulfillment until his grandson came of age. Curiously, a vote for Gaius was not just a vote for the House of Caesar, but also a vote for one of the biological sons of a much-beloved Vipsanian, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Surely, Livia's marginalized son, Tiberius, knew that actions speak louder than words, those of his stepfather Augustus, and those of the people. Just how sincere was Augustus in granting Tiberius the tribunician power as co-equal in governance of the empire? which he'd previously granted to Marcus Agrippa. And wasn't the electorate's choice of the child, Gaius Caesar, a slap in Tiberius's face? Wasn't their blatant hypocrisy unveiled as they complained that prior to Tiberius Claudius Nero and his brother, no Claudii Neronis had held the Fasces in over 200 years, when no Vipsanii prior to Marcus Agrippa had held the Fasces, ever. When her son had requested permission to retire to Rhodes, removing himself and his future from the immediate grasp of Augustus, Livia's husband had been infuriated. Her son, Tiberius, had sabotaged her husband's long-term plans to maintain Rome's Pax Romana, the golden age which Augustus had proudly delivered to a beleaguered Rome at the end of her civil wars. With her husband now in his mid-fifties, while his adopted grandsons and heirs were yet teens, Augustus purportedly needed someone to guide the ship, should something befall him in the interim. But why should her son be thrilled to function as a mere stopgap measure? When Tiberius had let it be known he would not be demeaned, embarking on a hunger strike and refusing all food for four days, Livia's husband had accused his stepson of acting nefariously. What was her son? Tiberius, up to, if not sowing division within Rome and working against Augustus in favor of his own son, Drusus. An angry and offended Tiberius had retrieved his last will and testament from the house of the Vestals. Before the very eyes of Livia and her husband, Tiberius had broken open the seal, determined to prove to his stepfather that he had no such designs on power. There. On the parchment, named as his primary beneficiaries, were the grandsons and adopted heirs of Augustus, Gaius and Lucius Caesar, relegating his own son, Drusus, to the position of secondary heir. Likely wishing to save face after levelling such a defamatory accusation against her son, Augustus finally relented and granted his wife's son, 
Tiberius, permission to leave Rome. However, as long as Livia's husband was breathing, he would never veer from his long-term plan. The departure of Tiberius meant only that Augustus must now adjust his timetable for succession. His method was no mystery, as he refocused his energies on his now popular grandson and heir. The year following Gaius's election to the consulship, Caesar Augustus appointed his grandson a priest in the College of Pontifexes. He also allowed Gaius Caesar to join the Senate at the age of 15, with certain restrictions regarding the level of his participation. And because of his status as a consul elect, Gaius was permitted to express his opinion when asked for it, but was otherwise instructed to merely sit, observe, and learn. In addition to making the son of Julia a senator, and a pontifex, Gaius's grandfather also named him Princeps Juventutis, or first among Rome's youth, a title which came with a publicly funded horse. Augustus left no stone unturned when it came to equipping Gaius Caesar to become the voice of his generation. For his second heir, Lucius Caesar, Augustus had promised the same titles and offices, waiving their customary age requirements to match the opportunities he had provided for Gaius. And so, Livia Drusilla, whose Claudian lineage Augustus had once desired as evidence of his traditional republican sympathies, with one of her sons dead and the other in exile, was now dislodged, forced to witness the rising tide of populism, and consider the spectre of a Rome, under mob rule. Once Julia's sons rose to power in Rome, what would be her fate? Would history remember her only as the woman who had replaced Julia's mother? Though Livia had wealth sufficient to sustain herself without the support of her husband, she knew how fast that wealth could disappear. Her own father had been quite wealthy, before losing everything under the prescriptions imposed by the second triumvirate. She also knew that her legal sui juris rights, her grounds for the level of independence she enjoyed, were revocable having been created by her husband's political fiction on her behalf, given she had raised only two of the three children required for a noble lady to reach such a level of independence. But if Rome was a wayward daughter to Augustus, then Livia Drusilla was surely the mother of a third child. Yet, once endowed with the tribunician powers, how long would it be before Gaius or Lucius cancelled her sui juris rights? and confiscated her properties and income. And so, as any Roman woman of her status who expected to outlive her husband, Livia Drusilla desperately needed her son to ensure her safety and provide for her care as she advanced in age. But how could a conservative Claudian woman, surrounded by a clique of young court populists, manage to get her son recalled to Rome? Especially when his own wife, the spoiled daughter of Augustus, had rallied her forces against him. Livia Drusilla hoped to discover just exactly who, apart from her son's wife Julia, was driving the populist rise of Julia's teenage sons. Of course, Julia's Cornelian relatives had supported Gaius Caesar, but such support was to be expected. Gaius's blood was, after all, as much Cornelian as it was Vipsanian and Julian. Most families threw their electoral support behind blood, and it stood to reason that Appius Claudius, the grandson of Publius Clodius and Fulvia, would bring the support of the city's plebs to Julia's party. But Gaius Caesar had not gone at the 6 BC consulship through the efforts of a single family and a city full of plebs. The Roman people had unanimously called for the election of Augustus's grandson. So just who was it that might have had enough leverage to unite multiple families in a vast political alliance? And what was being promised, in exchange for their support? Livia needed a covert ally. She needed someone who could easily blend in with her daughter-in-law, Julia's crowd but who also had nothing to gain by the rise of Julia's sons. 
and then it dawned on her. Livia Drusilla was not alone after all. The mother of Tiberius came to the realization that in the widow of her late younger son, Drusus, she had a natural ally. Antonia was not only mother to three Claudian children, but she was a daughter of Marcus Antonius. And in the coming Rome of Julius' sons, such a woman's children could expect little in the way of political preference. Those children, Shermanicus, Livilla and Claudius, would all be cast aside in favour of the blood descendants of Caesar Augustus. With their father, Drusus, deceased, and their mother, Antonia, doggedly resisting Augustus's every attempt to marry her off to a new man, Livia suddenly saw her path forward. These Claudian grandchildren shared her plight. Only through her son, Tiberius, could any of them hope to rise 